The first time I heard about mob programming, I thought this is crazy, can't possibly work. What a waste of time all those people working together when they could be working in parallel. What sort of company would ever do something like this? How could you solve complex architecture and design problems by committee like this? How do you stop people being bored, the person with the keyboard doing all the work and everyone else playing games on their phone? Then I stopped and listened to myself for a moment. And I realised that actually these were the same arguments that I'd been dismissing for years in the context of pair programming. So I decided instead to listen a bit more carefully and to suspend judgment for a while, while I learned a bit more. So what is mob programming and how can it possibly make any sense for everyone on a team to work on everything together all of the time? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content here today, hit like as well. All of these things went through my head while I was attending a conference that I was speaking at. I was listening to Woody Zool, who first spoke publicly about the idea of mob programming the year before. By that time, Woody and his team had been practicing mobbing for about three or four years. Woody's succinct description captures mob programming perfectly. All the brilliant people working on the same thing at the same time in the same place and on the same computer. This does sound kind of crazy, but I was a long-standing advocate of pair programming by this time, and I'd seen it revolutionise the work of teams, and so I decided to defer judgement for a while. I talked with Woody and found him to be very team-centred, thoughtful and a very kind person, but also the holder of some strong, sometimes radical sounding opinions, mob programming being amongst them. At this point, I assumed that I'd probably never get to see mob programming in action. I was just starting out as an independent consultant at this time, and so wasn't often writing code as part of a team anymore. So while I'm pretty certain that if I'd been part of a team, I may have well have suggested us trying mob programming out, even if only for fun, I assumed that I'd never get to see it in action. But later I did. Before I go any further, let me say thank you to our sponsors. We're fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts, Tricentis, Transfic, Roost and Sleuth. All these companies are for products and services that are well aligned with the topics that we discuss on this channel every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and software engineering, click on the links in the description below to check them out. Mob programming, as Woody described it, is actually a simple idea. Everyone works on almost everything together all of the time. Everything that a typical software development team does is done in collaboration with everyone else. Gathering requirements, refactoring to make the next change easier, design, architecture decisions, testing, development, release, everything. If you suspend your scepticism for just a moment, this idea has some good things going for it. And the page on the Agile Alliance website lists all of these things as benefits. And they make sense. A mob programming team is not likely to have communications problems because everyone is communicating all day every day. Mobbing teams are a cross-functional collection of people, including people representing the customer viewpoint as well as more technical people. As a result, they're unlikely to struggle to make decisions because everyone involved in any relevant decision is there at the time when the team needs to make it. There's no context switching between tasks, no more politics, or at least no politics that are in plain sight, because decisions are based on discussions that everyone is involved in. If you don't like something, you have the chance to say so, and gather support, or otherwise, with, with, with your teammates. Technically, the team can all agree or not to address technical debt and discuss design choices and decisions as a group with everyone able to contribute and to learn from those decisions. As a result, there's better understanding of the reason behind the choices that are made and the detail of the design being implemented. All this sounds pretty good, maybe too good to be true, and from my experience of pair programming, I was certainly open to the idea that some of the advantages might also be a bit more subtle 
than some of these things and hard to understand until you'd actually experience them in person. As I said, I didn't expect to ever find out for myself. And then I got a phone call from an old friend. My friend had done some work helping to get a small team established and practicing continuous delivery. He then moved on uh, to some other things, but sometime later, the team had contacted him and explained that they'd started mob programming. They, they decided to try mobbing as an experiment for a single sprint, but they'd liked it so much that they'd never gone back. So six months later, they were now always working as a mob. The team invited Dave, my friend, and I along to work with them for the day. I confess, I was still a little bit sceptical, but I had decided those few years before when I'd heard Woody speak that I'd try and keep an open mind. And I hadn't seen Dave for ages and so I agreed to do it and that would be fun. Worst case, Dave and I could go for a beer afterwards and moan about mob programming. But that's not what happened. This was a small team five people, so adding Dave and I was, or at least you'd normally expect it to be, extremely disruptive for the team. They were working on software for an IoT device associated with monitoring home energy usage. Dave knew the product, the people and the company, though his knowledge of the code was more than a year out of date by this time. David mentioned to me what he was doing when he worked there, but other than that, I knew nothing about the project or the code base. In a mob, the team works together so that they can see what's going on uh, with this, on the screen of the one person who is actually doing the typing. The person doing the typing changes often. This team operated a 15 minute timer and they took the time limit pretty seriously. But obviously the person at the keyboard could finish a thought if they were in the middle of something when the timer went off. When the driver's time at the keyboard ran out, everyone moved one seat along, with the person at the end of the line taking the place of the previous driver. The driver joining the group of advisors at the other end of the line. And then the advisor who just moved into the seat immediately before the driver at the end of the row became the new navigator. Of course, things don't need to work exactly like this in a mob, but the idea is that everyone gets to play the role of advisor, navigator or driver at some point on a regular basis throughout the day. The idea of navigators and drivers is largely similar to that in pair programming, but may be applied a little bit more strictly. The person at the keyboard is the driver and they are largely there to capture the thoughts of everyone else in the form of code. The navigator directs the driver on what to code. The advisors discuss everything with the navigator and mostly the driver shuts up and listens and types. The idea here is not for the driver to be the central person to do their own thing. This is not your chance to ignore everyone else and implement your one true design. Every step of the implementation, every line of the code really is the result of collaboration. As people sometimes say about pair programming, every idea in the code has flowed through at least two heads. Or in the case of mobbing, several heads. The mob is structured to kind of force that collaboration to happen. The job of the driver then is to translate the ideas of the mob into the code. If the driver wants to contribute to the discussion, they do that when their time as driver is finished. This may sound pretty alien, and it's certainly a big step if you're more used to sitting in a private office or a cubicle with your headphones on while you're coding. But it is a smaller step from pair programming. Clearly, my example was pre-COVID. We were all sat in the same room. So this was a co-located team. The description of mobbing includes the phrase in the same place. So it may sound like remote working is a barrier. But actually, in some ways, it can be an advantage. What in the same place really means in the context of a mob is that everyone can see the code being written and can talk to each other. And that's often easier to set up with conferencing software than it is by buying a bunch of big screens and lining up some chairs so everybody can see the screens. In case you're interested, I've included a link to a post on remote mobbing in the description to this video. 
We began the day with the team, Dave and I, standing in front of a whiteboard and talking about the system. The team introduced us, or at least me, to the system, and then we all started talking about the new feature that we'd be working on on this day. The change that we were tackling was a kind of significant one. The team had reached that point where new requirements were starting to show that some of previous design assumptions now needed adjusting a bit to support these new requirements. The team had a good working deployment pipeline and so good feedback on fine-grained changes. If you'd like to learn more about what it takes to build and manage an effective deployment pipeline like that, check out my training course, Anatomy of a Deployment Pipeline, which describes in detail the philosophy and design approach needed to build great deployment pipelines. There's a link in the description to that below too. The changes that the team wanted to make on this day weren't trivial, they were structural, um, so the plan was to start with some refactoring, to make it easier to add the first of the new type of requirements when they came up. We discussed a few of the new requirements to put context on what it is that we wanted to do, why the existing design didn't really fit them as well as the team would like, and while we had our early morning coffee, we discussed some of the different options that we could think of that might be worth trying. Both Dave and I are pretty experienced developers and have a past in consultancy, so we were both pretty used to jumping in at the deep end in other people's code bases. And also, uh, a rather opinionated about design, I suppose. But I was immediately impressed with the level of collaboration in this team. So there were some people who talked more than others, certainly, but everyone contributed. And unlike lots of teams that I've met over the years, there was absolutely no defensiveness about design decisions that had gone before. Now, if I'm honest, I can't tell if that was a result of the mob programming or that this was just a nice group of people who were less egotistically tied to their design than usual. But my impression was that one of the side effects of the mob was that it had reduced the sense of personal ownership of parts of the code base and had fostered a much stronger sense of team ownership for all of it. The result of this was that it seemed to me that we were better able to dispassionately explore our options at this point without anyone's feeling being hurt, or at least as far as I could tell. At this point in the day, I assumed that we'd make a start on the refactoring probably try a couple of ideas and agree on the direction by the end of the day. But given the scale of the restructuring that we thought was needed, we'd almost certainly be leaving the team to finish the work over the next few days. I assumed that it would be a, at least a day or two before the team was ready to start adding the first of the new features that are, were going to depend upon these changes. As I said, Dave and particularly I weren't familiar with the code. But every time we made a suggestion that exposed our lack of knowledge of the code base, one of the team would be able to help us. Alter alternatively, Dave and I were both pretty experienced developers, and so some of our suggestions were clearly good and the team liked them, and were able to adapt them to their code base. The result was that our work that day was kind of greater than the sum of the parts. Everyone there contributed to the work, Although Dave and I were outsiders to the team, we contributed too, including suggesting some good ideas that I think helped to clarify the problem for the rest of the team, and helped us all as a group to eliminate potential alternative approaches without spending too much time and effort discussing them. One of the things that really surprised me that I wouldn't have expected before we began was that if anything, for this group of people, we spent less time debating which path to follow rather than more. By the end of the day, we completed the refactoring and implemented the first of the new features that depended on it. All tested, all finished to the point where it was ready for release into production. I was extremely surprised at the progress that we made on that day. I'm certain that it was a lot more than I could have done if I had been working alone. And I'm pretty sure that it was even more than I could have done if I had been familiar with the code base working on my own. I can't completely put my finger on why that is though. Sure, whenever I was stuck, someone else was in the mob had an idea or knowledge that unstuck me, 
but it certainly felt that we were going faster than even that seemed, would seem to allow for. I was very surprised at the progress that we made, but even more surprised when I realised that Dave and I should, and probably did, disrupt things. The team had spent more time than usual correcting our misconceptions of their code. We spent about an hour together before we even started coding while they explained the system and the nature of the problem to us. Imagine for a moment, particularly if you work in a small team, how disruptive it would be to add two people to it to work with you on it for a single day. A lot of teams, if needing to deliver, would probably ignore the newbies for at least a few days until they had time to help them to learn a bit more about the system. But not this team. Dave and I were not only brought into the team and learned about their system, but also contributed to the success of the team on that day. The downsides of mob programming seem, I suppose, mostly pretty obvious. How can four or five people make more progress working together than working alone? But this is almost certainly confusing busyness with efficiency. Just because I'm busy doesn't mean that I'm making good progress. There's always an overhead cost to communication, for example, which is eliminated when everybody shares the full context of every decision all of the time. Clearly, there's a point where the lines of the flow-based efficiency cross the, the lines of parallelizing things and working more efficiently that way. I'm pretty certain, though, that a mob of 50 people isn't going to work. But then again, if you have a single team of 50 people, you have other problems anyway. I don't know what the upper limit is, but based on my very limited experience of it, mobbing is a more efficient way of working than people working alone. Mob programming surprised me a lot. I'm still not entirely sure what I make of it. By default, my preference, maybe my habit is a better phrase, is pair programming. But one thing that I'm certain of is that mob or pair programming are both better than working alone in terms of the quality of our output, the effectiveness of collaboration, as a means of streamlining and strengthening the culture within teams and improving the bonds between team members. They also make it more fun, even if it doesn't make things more efficient. And actually, I'm pretty sure that we can make a decent case for improving efficiency too. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoy my stuff on this channel, please consider supporting our work and joining our Patreon community. Thank you and bye-bye.